In the early 1990s, the Royal Australian Navy was in a bit of a pickle. Its three Perth-class guided missile destroyers were getting very old, its weapon systems and sensors were becoming outdated, and they required a replacement. The Adelaide-class frigates were newer and still had some service life, but lacked the capability to fulfil the area air defence missions of a destroyer. The Australian Defence Force considered building an additional six Anzac-class frigates on top of what is already planned to fulfil the air defence role, but the Anzacs were too small to really satisfy that requirement. Therefore, by the year 2000, the Australian Defence Force had begun a project for the acquisition of dedicated air warfare destroyers, which would later become the Hobart class. The main role of the air defence destroyers is to escort a naval task force and provide protection for the most important ships like amphibious warships from threats like anti-ship missiles and hostile aircraft. However, the new destroyers will possess elder capabilities such as anti-submarine warfare, anti-ship strikes and support of amphibious landings through the employment of naval gunfire. The US Navy's Aegis Combat System, developed by Lockheed Martin, has been established as the leading naval weapon system in the world, especially at the time. Unsurprisingly, the Australian Navy decided that the future destroyers would be built around the Aegis Combat System. However, the actual ship to carry the system doesn't necessarily have to be American-designed. Several foreign companies submitted tenders for the ship to the Australian government. In the end, the two leading designs were the evolved Arleigh Burke Flight 2, which was modified from the US Navy's Arleigh Burks, and the Spanish frigate the Alvaro de Bazin, designed by the Spanish firm Navancha. The American evolved Arleigh Burke was initially the leading candidate. It was initially seen by the Australian government as the preferred design. The evolved Ale Burke was larger and had superior range and endurance, and had far greater firepower with a 90 cell VLS compared with just 48 on the Alvaro de Bazin. However, it was the more expensive design, meaning fewer ships could be built. While the original Ale Burke has of course been built at this point, the evolved Ale Burke existed only on paper as a design, so was seen as the riskier option. The Alvaro de Bazin, on the other hand, has already been built and were operational, and therefore they are predicted to be available four years earlier than the evolved Ale Burke. They were far cheaper, so saving the taxpayers some money. And there were benefits in choosing the same builder as that for the Canberra-class landing helicopter docks, which again is Navancia. So the Spanish Alvaro de Bazin design was ultimately selected. The contract for the ship was signed in October 2007. A contract for 8 billion Australian dollars for three ships was agreed, with the option for a fourth ship if wanted. The Naval League of Australia, which supported the strengthening of the Navy, really wanted a fourth ship, but the government opted not to because it was not perceived to be necessary for strategic requirements. The primary builder of the ship is the Australian Submarine Corporation, which manufactured the Collins-class submarines in the 1990s. The corporation's shipyard was to assemble the modules of the ship, the modules are produced by a combination of the Forgax Marine and Defence and BAE Systems Australia. The ships are to be named the Hobart, Brisbane and Sydney. The construction process was not an easy one. It was mired by controversy. In October 2010, one of the keel blocks manufactured by BAE for the lead ship was built incorrectly and incompatible with neighbouring sections. BAE Systems Australia blamed the error on faulty drawings from the designer, Navancha. A later investigation by the Australian government does suggest that it is the case. The ship's main mast module was rejected owing to numerous defects that require rework. 
25% of the Hobart's internal pipework had to be replaced owing to faulty manufacture. Construction errors continue to affect the second and the third ship, well after the lead ship. In the original plan, all three ships were to be commissioned by the end of 2016. However, owing to the sheer magnitude of problems encountered in the construction process, the commissioning for the class was pushed further and further out. Cost also escalated, although to be fair, not by very much, to an eventual $9.1 billion from the original $8 billion Australian dollars. The Hobart was launched in May 2015 and commissioned in September 2017. The Brisbane was launched in February 2016 and commissioned in October 2018. The last ship, the Sydney, was commissioned in May 2020, around four years behind the original schedule. Total displacement is 7,000 tonnes full load. Length is 147 metres, with a beam of 18.6 metres. Displacement is only slightly larger than the 6,500 tonnes full load of the Alvaro de Bazin frigate, with the same length and beam. Propulsion is combined diesel or gas, where the diesel engine is used for cruising, while the gas turbine is used to reach high speed. The ship uses two General Electric Model 7LM2500 SAMLG38 gas turbines with a total of 47,000 horsepower, and two Caterpillar Bravo 16V Bravo diesel engines. The two companies, General Electric and Caterpillar, are well-known manufacturers of gas turbines and diesel engines, respectively, among other products. Top speed is over 28 knots. Operational range is over 9,300 kilometers. The Hobart class is not the fastest, but does have a lot of range. The Australian Navy is happy with the trade-off between speed and range because endurance is important for Australian operating conditions. Complements is 186 plus 16 aircrew, although spare accommodation existed for a small number of additional passengers. The main weapon is the Mark 41 vertical launch system, located at the front just behind the gun. It comprises of 48 cells for carrying missiles. The VLS can fire the RIM-66 Standard Missile II for medium-range air defense and the Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile. The Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile has a shorter range than the Standard Missile II, but can be quad-packed four inside each cell. This massively increases the potential ammunition carried by the VLS. The Australian government has purchased more than 200 Tomahawk missiles from the United States, worth 1.7 billion Australian dollars. The Australian government confirmed that its Hobart-class destroyers will soon be equipped with the Tomahawks, possibly starting in 2024. The Tomahawk is a subsonic land attack missile with a range of 1,500 kilometers. This will add materially to the power projection capability of the Hobart class. Originally, two quad canisters for the Harpoon anti-ship missiles were installed. The Harpoon is of course getting pretty outdated. They will soon be replaced on the destroyers by the far more capable naval strike missile developed by the Norwegian firm Konsberg. The naval strike missile has a longer range than the Harpoon, at above 200 kilometers, and has a stealthy design making it more difficult to defend against. If the anti-air missiles fail to take down the targets at the medium range, the Hobart class has a phalanx close-in weapon system, or SEWERS, facing towards the aft, ready to tackle threats coming from behind in the short range. In the front of the ship, it has two M242 Bushmaster autocannons defending against threats coming from ahead. The ship also has several decoy launchers firing the domestically developed active missile decoy, known as the NOCA. It is a rocket-propelled disposable active decoy designed to lure anti-ship missiles away from their targets. 
these weapon systems form the final line of defense against incoming missiles. The Hobart are built around the Aegis combat system, specifically the Aegis Baseline 7.1 version. One of its most important components is the AN Spy 1 DV airspand radar, optimized for long range air search. It consists of four large arrays mounted inside the superstructure, but below the main mast, and provides 360 degree continuous coverage. Mounted in the mast is the AN SPQ 9B horizon search radar which is placed high to enable a longer radar range. The horizon search radar is used for scanning the surface of the sea. They are used to detect and track incoming missiles that often travels at a sea skimming altitude, meaning very close to the surface to avoid detection by air search radars. Additionally, to help control the ship's own missiles after launch, there is a Mark 99 fire control system to handle missile direction to the target and to provide terminal guidance once the anti-air missile is near the target. To achieve this, the Mark 99 fire control system has two target illumination radars. It is a major component of the Aegis combat system. Once Aegis detected an incoming threat with its radars, it uses a decision-making computer to choose the best weapons to engage the target. It integrates the information gathered from a large number of sources and tries to make the optimal decision about how to respond. Automation is a key advantage of the Aegis system. The main mast also contains the ship's electronic warfare system including an electronic support measure to detect the radio waves emitted by the enemy's radars. The ship has cooperative engagement capability, allowing us to share targeting data with other friendly assets that also has this capability, a major advantage in modern network-centric warfare. They can share targeting information with other destroyers in the class, or potentially with allied naval assets with the same capability. While the Hobart is an air defense warship, it has pretty good anti-submarine capabilities. The ships are fitted with an ultra-electronics sonar system, which includes a hull-mounted sonar and a towed variable depth sonar, which includes both active and passive modes. It has a passive torpedo detection system, and a towed torpedo decoy to try to eliminate torpedo threats using a soft kill method. The main anti-submarine weapon is the single MH-60 Romeo Seahawk helicopter, one of the most widely used ASW helicopter in Western navies. It has all the qualities desirable for an anti-submarine chopper, including long endurance for prosecuting the targets, reasonable speed, a large capacity for sonar boys, and the payload to carry two torpedoes. And most importantly, the Seahawk is small enough with its rotor blades folded to fit inside the hangar of the destroyer. In a non-ideal situation, where the submarine is within torpedo range, it can be engaged by the Mark 32 Mod 9 twin torpedo launchers. There are two of these launchers for firing lightweight ASW torpedoes. However, if the Hobart class has to resort to this weapon, it does mean that the ship is within range of the enemy submarine's torpedoes, because the heavy torpedoes used by the submarines will have a greater range. The Hobart class of the Royal Australian Navy definitely had a troubled beginning. It was built at a time of constraints in the defense budget, and following a long period when the country has not built large surface combatants, and has lost a lot of the experience in shipbuilding it previously had. Despite these difficulties, the Hobart class pulled through, becoming a capable warship in its own right. It is not the most heavily armed, nor the largest, or the most powerful, 
but it appears to serve Australian requirements extremely well. The Australian government has announced the upgrade of the Aegis combat system on the Hobart to a more up-to-date Aegis Baseline 9 or 10. This signals that the Royal Australian Navy intends to use the Hobart class as its front-line warship for several decades to come.